out today. Uh, spring is over, that was yesterday, we're now in the summer. Uh, it's a real prize of a day. After Yemen and North Korea, we're coming back to our own hemisphere tonight to learn about a hot spot that's much closer to home, Mexico. We're fortunate to have as our guide Jorge de los Santos. Professor de los Santos received his undergraduate degree in economics from the Tecnologico de Monterrey in Monterrey, Mexico and a master's in public administration and public policy from Columbia's, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. With a fellowship at the Foreign Policy Association and the Carter, Ford, and Hewlett Fellowships in Social Sciences, and as a board member of the Binational Sustainability Laboratory, he's continued his research in public policy. He's currently a visiting researcher at the Woodrow Wilson School and senior advisor to the Innovations for Successful Societies program at the Woodrow Wilson School. With that background and those interests, he's eminently qualified to help us understand what's going on right next door in Mexico. His topic tonight will be Mexico after the elections, the new political landscape and its repercussions. So I'll take you now 
to the United States in the 1930s and, and talk to you about what happened there in terms of security. There was a lot of crime. There were, there were corruption syndicates uh, where municipal and state officials were engaged at the different levels of corruption. There were battles for territorial control throughout the United States, especially in Chicago, as you know. And the federal government around that time decided to take down the crime cartels and the gangs. So what is going on in Mexico right now is something actually very, very similar. We have these cartels that are trying to control different areas of the country. And there's a lot of, of deep corruption at the local and state levels in Mexico. And that you, that, that, the, the government, the federal government, because of change, and now is trying to respond to its people, uh, is, is, is fighting an, an, an all-out war on crime. And is trying to figure out a way to battle them down. So it's, it's using all these resources. However, it's difficult right now because a lot of a lot of folks at the municipal state governments are, are protecting a lot of these different cartels. So I'll tell you now to the United States in different areas and an imaginary one in, in 2025. So uh, in the 1950s, you, you had a stable and sustained growth, macroeconomic stability in the United States, and a large manufacturing growth. Um, also in the 2000s, you had the whole innovation and information technology revolution. And, and hopefully in the future, we'll have truly global trade in the United States as well. What's going on in the United States, in Mexico right now, is something very, very similar. Today, today Mexico exports more manufactured products than all the rest of Latin America combined, all of it. So it's, it's macroeconomic stable. A lot of its people are there, they're about 29 years old or younger. And, and Mexico, it's, it joined India and China in terms of exporting <coughs> information technology services as well. And, and something that probably you didn't know is that Mexico has more, than more free trade agreements in, in place than any other country in the world. So politically now I'm going to try to, I, I try to look for, for a time in which the United States, uh, everybody in Congress agreed to keep political reforms. Uh, <laughs> you know, was, I couldn't find it. Uh, so uh, I tried to uh, find a time where there, there was a, a political system that allowed more parties you know, to join the ranks. And sometimes you had an independent candidate that tried to run for office. But, but usually you have a two-party system. And also I, I tried to, to find a, a time in history in the United States in which all, all the, the balloting process was, was uniform, transparent, and secure. You know, as you might remember, the, the, the hanging shacks in the all war push election. But, but what, what is happening in Mexico right now politically is, is, is pretty much that. Uh, the three different parties, the big ones, are working together to try to, to fight against these large monopolies and, and the teachers' unions as well. They're trying to come up with new laws to manage energy and also the financial system as well. And as a matter of fact, there's in Mexico, like the United States, there's small parties that, that have a voice in Congress and actually help, they, they manage and control different committees and, and, and therefore giving them voice into the political process. And also something that you may not know, that, that the electoral system in, in Mexico is one of the most uh, innovative ones. Uh, their their tamper-proof ID voting card it's, a, it's, it's one of the best ones, and it's, I, it's, it, Mexico, it took them a lot of time to develop it because they really wanted to create a system in which they would not allow any uh, people to cheat the system. So Mexico worked a lot on it. So uh, this is a, a quote from the Washington Post actually about, about three days ago, which it says, uh, Washington should be sharing Mexico's gridlock costing and taking it as an example. Uh, and it's basically talking about the recent reforms, political reforms that Mexico undertook to, to fight monopolies and promote uh, economic growth. So now I'm going to make another comparison, but, but the United States now in terms of education. You have great engineers, uh, very strong skilled labor force, great schools, uh, especially in its schools, and, but you have an, a K-12 uh, K system that is lagging and very powerful teachers' unions. 
and, and Mexico is, actually has very similar problems. Uh, they have great engineers, great elite schools as well, but they have a struggling k both system, and they have very powerful teacher units as well. And those are, are probably one of the biggest problems that Mexico needs to solve in the foreseeable future. So, so with, uh, with that landscape, I just, I just want to give you that so you can understand a little bit what's going on in Mexico, I wanted to talk to you about three things that may be important to you because they, they're going to impact your, your life here in the United States. And the, the most important one I'll talk is security. So I'll tell you a little bit about how crime and security evolve in, in Mexico and what's going on right now, where I think it's going to be heading in the near future. So in 2000, as, as, as you know, uh, <coughs> the security apparatus in Mexico was a political arm. It was used to uh, control uh, society and to, uh, and to help the political system to stay in power. Therefore, a lot of, of those folks in the security system, in the, in the, for example, the Mexican FBI, they were engaged in corruption and their purpose was not to fight crime, but was to maintain the current political system. So that was the most important part of it. But uh, when the new government came to power in 2000 and eventually 2006, um, they needed to get rid of these units because they said, well, these units are actually, uh, uh, they're not fighting crime, they're actually trying to, to help you to, to maintain control, political control. So they, they tried to dismantle them and they fired about two-thirds of all the Mexican FBI force, labor force. And unfortunately, they, they were not able to fire them and, uh, because then the force ruled that that was illegal, so they retired them all. And, uh, and, and the government says, well, what, what can we do to, to get rid of all of these folks that, that are pretty much corrupt, and a lot of them, you know, uh, they're not really working to, to help, you know, uh, security in Mexico. Well, they says, well, Let's get rid of the whole unit. So they actually, in Mexico, they came up with a law to get rid of the whole Mexican FBI, and they created a new one from scratch. So they closed down the whole ministry. They created a new one. And with that, they hired uh, professionals to lead that effort. So a lot of people before, they had about a third grade educational level, the ones that were fired. But a lot of, uh, they were suddenly left, and they became unemployed. So they joined the ranks of the cartels. A lot of them uh, eventually led these cartels, and that's the, the example of the, of the Zetas in uh, <coughs> north, uh, west, northeast Mexico. And, and what they, they do pretty, pretty much, these groups, is that they had the expertise, communication expertise, weapons expertise, and they also had communications expertise to, to make, to enhance their criminal activities at a complete different level that Mexico has never seen before. So uh, if you add to that, uh, that that weapons were very easy to buy here in the United States, uh, they pretty much went to Arizona or California or Texas, they bought the weapons and they brought them to Mexico. That's how these cartels, and also they, they bought communication <coughs> systems here in the United States, and they used them to beef up their system. But, but Mexico, at that time, and still now does, has a, an independent and professional FBI, a new FBI workforce. So this uh, group, in tandem with the, with the United States, they started to fight back and to try to get rid of these cartels. So, um, and what happened is that the United States started closing, they closed the border, uh, providing intelligence to the Mexican FBI to fight these, these crime cartels, and the crime cartels uh, found out that it was now very difficult to get drugs into the United States. So they had a problem then, there, and then they decided, well, if we cannot stay in the drug business because it's very difficult, what are we going to do with all this muscle and with all these people that we just hired? So we're just going to diversify. So diversify into other industries, so extortion, kidnapping, uh, car theft and so on. And, and actually this is, and, and what is happening right now is that the federal government has been fighting and fighting and fighting them a lot, uh, in, in collaboration with the United States. But now a lot of these large criminal groups are fragmented. So they're not as big, but still they're, they're around. And, and this is a quote, uh, well this is 
this is a testimony from Gianni Napolitano uh, in 2011, in which he says that, that actually Mexican drug cartels are the greatest organized crime threat to the United States. Now, um, so, but that the, the Mexican cartels are not are fragmenting and not dispersing at other areas. So that's why you see that, for example, in Monterrey, Mexico, which is it was historically a very safe place, now there's a lot of uh, drug cartels operating there. And also, there's other places like in Puebla, Mexico, where there's drug cartels operating now there. Also, a lot of these cartels and those criminal gangs move into the United States. And, and they collaborated with a lot of people here. See, these are two notes, one from the Washington Post, which you have banks helping some of these folks to move money into the United States, and the other ones from New York Times, in which you actually have US agents uh, that are helping to actually launder some of that money uh, for the drug cartels. Um, so what, what I think is going to happen uh, is that, that, that eventually, it's going to take time, but, but crime will stabilize in, in Mexico uh, and it will be greatly reduced. Just like in the United States in the 1930s, it took 10, 20 years uh, to get rid of all these criminal uh, organizations. In Mexico, it's going to take some time to get rid of them as well. But it will depend in, in four key factors. The first one is that uh, the, the weapons that are provided by these cartels by the United States. For them, it's very easy to buy the weapons here and take them over there to Mexico. There's there's no cost. I mean, if you, if you drive a truck, you can buy as many automatic weapons as you want or semi-automatic weapons as you want here in the United States and drive a truck back to Mexico with, without clearing customs and bring those guns into the country. So that's, that's, that's a big problem that needs to be solved. So as long as they keep getting weapons, uh, these, these crime syndicates are going to have all the necessary resources to keep on going and surviving. The, the other thing in Mexico is that you really, uh, 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 you really need to understand that the Mexican judicial system is structured in a way to protect uh, the, the innocent, uh, just like in the United States. But in Mexico, it takes a lot of times to uh, a lot of time, especially two three years, to finish. Uh, uh, a case, and, and most of these cases, about 90% of the cases brought by prosecutors are, are lost, the majority of them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what happens is that the Mexicans' officials, uh, prosecutors, they put together very poor indictments, and they don't have the necessary resources of the educational level to come up with all the evidence and put everything in a very coherent way so that the judge will say, yeah, this person is guilty. Uh, so that's something that Mexico needs to work on and hopefully can reform in the next six years. And then also something that Mexico needs to keep on doing is to they need to really keep on fighting crime. They, can't, they should not stop right now. The crime cartels are, are, are polarizing, they're getting smaller, and, and they, they need to keep the fight on going. They need to keep the fight going. So now that's, 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 uh, that's the, the evolution of crime in Mexico. And now I'm going to switch a little bit and I'll talk to you a little bit about migration in Mexico. Uh, this is actually a historic reversal in the, in the history of, uh, of Mexico-U.S. relations. And, and if you see that a lot of Mexicans are moving uh, from the United States back to Mexico, and I'll tell you a bit about some of the reasons why. And, and also there's less Mexicans coming into, uh, into the United States as well. And, and this is something that happened in the last five years. And, and why? Why is that? Well, one of, one of the reasons is that the economy in Mexico is, is better. And there's more opportunities and they're, they're getting more opportunities as, as time goes on. But, but also all this anti-immigration sentiment and the laws, for example, as we did 70 in Arizona and other places, you know, that those ones also help reduce immigration uh, into the United States. But, but, but the, 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 the potential problems the United States going to have is that a lot of these immigrants were really the, the labor force behind a lot of sectors. And one of them is, for example, is the agricultural sector, which about 95% of all the employees there are actually immigrants from, from Mexico and Central America. And that eventually is going to drive the prices up in agriculture. And uh, I was in Arizona uh, a year ago, and we were talking to some farmers, American farmers, and what they were doing right now is, is, is we cannot uh, uh, get our crops because we don't have the labor force to get them. 
So what we're doing right now, we're moving our farms to Mexico. So, and, and you'll see this more and more and more. Uh, so you have these you have these American cowboys, you know, in Mexico right now, running large farms. And uh, and it's impressive when you go to the border, you'll see that they they have the distribution operation in the United States, but actually they're farming in Mexico. So that raises a lot of questions about food security and, and what type of food uh, you're eating as well. So uh, now I'll I'll I just wrap up with, with Mexico's economy right now. Um, Mexico's economy is growing strong, it's stable, and there's there's going to be more and more opportunities. Uh, it's, it's an attractive market, uh, not just for the United States and for Europe, but also for India and China. They're, they're moving operations there now. Mm -hmm. And actually, Mexico is opening also business operations in China and India as well. A lot of these large monopolies, they're, they're building different assembly plants in China and India. So, so Mexico is sort of becoming and evolving a hub you know, for commerce and, and innovation now. So what, what Mexico needs in the future? Uh, and, and now after I finish this, I would like to, to open the floor for questions, because probably you're going to have a lot of questions about what's going on. Uh, but the first one is Mexico really needs a balanced government uh, right now. Balance of power, just like in the United States. Sometimes the president is too powerful, sometimes the judicial powers are too, too powerful, sometimes the media is too powerful, the businesses are too powerful, so it needs a balanced government. And, and because of Mexico's young democracy, it's just been about, uh, we're talking about 12 years, 13 years, since it's actually opened up and changed. Um, Me Mexico has been learning how to operate, but, but still it's going to take time until it really comes up with the institutions to have a, a really balanced uh, government. Uh, also, Mexico really needs uh, clear rules of the game. Um, the, 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 the Supreme Court of Mexico is becoming more powerful now, and, and they try to be responsive to the needs of the people and try to to, uh, to, to respond to the lawmakers' demands of, of making better um, uh, reviews of, of the laws. But, but, uh, but it has not yet been at the level that, that you expect from a country as Mexico. Uh, but you'll see more changes there as, as uh, the time goes on. The, the other two ones that are key and very important is educational reform in Mexico. Uh, Mexico, just like in the United States, needs to reform its K-12 system and also it needs to uh, figure out a way of, of partner or, or, or tackle um, teachers' unions. And, and in terms of security, it needs to continue its reforms and figure out a way to continue um, that, that, the fight of crime. Also, as, as we talked, uh, Mexico really needs anti-loving uh, and antitrust laws. Uh, the companies are way, way too powerful. Um, and and, and they're, they're not just becoming powerful in Mexico, but they're becoming powerful in Latin America. I mean, for example, Semex is the second largest cement company in the world. Um, uh, Telmet, the cell phone company in Mexico, America, America Mobile, actually the largest cell phone company in the world. So it's, it's very powerful in, in Latin America as well, and some of them at the global mm -hmm. scale. Um, and Mexico needs a lot of credibility. Uh, the government needs a lot of credibility from the people. Traditionally, Mexicans do not believe in the institution of the government because they thought the government was there because somebody took control of it, but it's, they did not feel that they were representative of their votes uh, because it was the same system. But, but uh, as time goes on, uh, Mexicans are going to be more responsive to that change and are going to feel that their, their, their voting is going to be powerful and can change government. So um, until that happens, uh, Mexicans uh, are going to have a struggle in supporting institutions such as, uh, for example, a Mexican FBI or a security system uh, that they deeply distrust. So with that, I would like to uh, open the, the floor for, for any questions that you may have, and then have a discussion about that. Thank you. about 70 years, 
uh, and, and the same political control apparatus. So the institutions were built around uh, a strategy to maintain the government in control. Um, so uh, people were disenfranchised, they were not engaged with the government. They always thought that the government was a part of an independent political process. So in terms of security, a lot of the security apparatus in Mexico was designed to maintain and to keep political power and societal control. It was not to, to actually fight crime. So, so the crime that was fought was just the one that, that, uh, that did not agree with the current political system. But if the political system of the, of the, of the persons in power actually agree with that corruption or those crimes, then the police did not prosecute. So, uh, so the, the change in what is significant in, in Mexico, not just in, in terms of security, but also in terms of, of um, how Mexicans are, are believing in, in themselves um, and, and, and how they're now taking so, some of their entrepreneurial uh, feelings back into it. Before, it was very difficult for a Mexican to open a company you know, to, uh, to uh, before before 2000, to uh, to to compete in the in you know in, in, in open a maker, for example. For them, it was very difficult because uh, most of the businesses were controlled by these powerful uh, 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 political um, folks, but also a large and very wealthy political families as well. So so you see that entrepreneurial change and also a political and, and, and change and security change in Mexico after after 2000. Yeah. Well, well it, it all actually started in 1968 uh, when uh, in Mexico um, it was about it was a uh, Mexico was was host for the Olympics and and, and uh, Mexicans were protesting uh, against uh, you know against you know the current government because and, and, and they had there were a lot of young young people you know protesting this <coughs> pretty much in any other place in the world so the government because they, they had the Olympics and they were going to be in Mexico they said well we just need to get rid of them and basically they suppressed them like the Tiananmen Square in China so they killed a lot of them a lot of them disappeared so this fuel and anger in the people and they it created a lot of independent parties there. So it's about 1968, 1970. These parties eventually grew stronger, and uh, over the years, over decades, you know, they, they were so they were powerful enough to win local election, elections and state elections, and eventually they actually won the presidency in Mexico in 2000. But but it, 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 but that was actually the change. Uh, most people agree that it was about 1968 when, when, when people say, well, this government is not just giving me, but also it's, it's suppressing. Reading a lot about uh, Pope Francis in Argentina and Latin America and moving to Rome, uh, what is the role of the church in Mexico today? It's it, it's Mexico and the church. It, there's there's a there's a very interesting relationship there before, before, because most of the institutions in Mexico were actually created by the church. Right? A lot of them. Uh, a lot of schools, uh, a lot of hospitals. Uh, uh, the first marriages uh, uh, were actually conducted by the church. Um, and but 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 with Benito Juarez, the Mexican president, is the one that said, you know what, we need to divide, uh, um, um, divide powers, and and, and 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 we need to create a new governmental system in which church is not engaged. Um, however, church, the, the power of the church has been increasing in Mexico over the years. And, uh, and, and but it's been rocky for a long time. For example, uh, about, about 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 ten years ago, uh, a bishop uh, was actually a cardinal, not a bishop, cardinal was actually killed by some of these crime syndicates in Mexico. And, and but but the, the Mexican uh, uh, church has been, has been trying to be more vociferous in its um, support of conservative uh, parties in Mexico now. And, and that's something that, that did not happen before. Before 2000, the church never got into the political process, but what you see right now is that they're getting really engaged into it and they're getting into the debate. So uh, the abortions debate, for example, they're very, they're very active. 
and also they are active in promoting certain politicians to, to win elections. How much faster is the Mexican economy growing say, than the U.S. economy? And is that sustainable for a long period of time? If you look at the, at the, at the demographics of Mexico, it's, it's, it's going to be sustainable for the next 20, 30 years. I mean, Mexico has this demographic uh, plus. But then Mexico reach, is going to reach a plateau, and then it's, not, it's going to be pretty much flat. There's not going to be any people migrating to Mexico. Uh, so, so hopefully 10, 25 years uh, of growth. And it's about two to three percentage points higher than the United States. Yeah, I was just curious, a couple of years ago, what did they call the one who was in power that was always talking about getting the crime, reducing the, you know, the war against the drugs? And then they would say on TV, you know, 30,000 have been killed, all of that. You don't hear about that so much now. Are they still after all the drug cartels and stuff? Yes, they are. But they're, uh, they're, but they're more, um, they're, they're politically savvy in terms of how they, they, they do it. Uh, uh, Calderon used to, to promote a lot of this continuous fight with the, with the media, but this, the, this current government does not do that. Uh, so they changed that. But the military is still on the streets in Mexico. Calderon put the military uh, to help this new Mexican FBI, because as, as you might remember from the talk, uh, um, Calderon got rid of the, of the Mexican FBI, fired everybody. So he says, well, while I build this new one and hire professionals to, to run it, I need somebody to help me out with crime. So who can help me? So he brought the military to help him fight crime. So while he was doing that, uh, um, Calderon, um, change the dynamics of, of how the army and, 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 the, and, the, and the civil uh, security forces in Mexico uh, worked. And eventually a lot of these military personnel took over of their responsibilities for civilian security in different areas of Mexico. And this continues to this day. A lot of, of, of former military officials of, uh, of the Calderon administration, they're still running a lot of the security uh, infrastructure in Mexico. What's happened to Calderon? He's a car right now. He's a visiting uh, researcher. <laughs> He's going to be there for a year. Then he's probably going to look for, for a job here. <laughs> yes? Mexico has the, 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 the workforce necessary, skill workforce necessary to sustain this growth and where they're getting this, this workforce. Uh, Mexico has very good schools, uh, especially not just elite schools, but uh, very good uh, universities. Um, and, and, and there were several studies in which they compare the quality of the engineers produced by the Mexican universities versus the ones in India and China, not the elite ones, but, but yeah. just regular <coughs> universities. And, and they found out that the engineers in Mexico, with Mexico were at that even higher level than the ones in India and China. How, however, Mexico is not producing enough of them. Uh, so Mexico really needs to invest a lot in education, not just in the critical system, but in creating new uh, universities to sustain this growth. That is one of the key challenges that Mexico is going to have over the years. Yes. So, so Calderon and, and Fox, they, they really uh, changed the dynamics of the relationship of Mexico with the United States, and they really uh, look into the United States as a, as a partner. Uh, but now this new administration has been really looking into uh, Central America and South America. It's actually its first trip was to Central America and then South America as well. And, and I, one of, his, uh, of the president's ideas, the current president's ideas, Peña Nieto, is to, uh, to, to make Mexico as one of the leading forces and, and, and in Latin America, the voice of Latin America. So as you know, Mexico is the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. Um, and and it it's wants to regain its place, not just here in North America, but in Latin America as well. But you'll see more of that as, as Mexico grows in, in influence. In, as a matter of fact, in, if you go to, to pretty much any country in Central America, the largest companies there are, are Mexican companies. 
Mexico is often being criticized for lax environmental regulation. Is that improved at all? Um, in some areas of the country. For example, in Mexico City, before it was horrendous, uh, it was um, very difficult to just drive around, and, and they came up with a very good system to, to get rid of different industries, and they came up with a system called Hoy No Circula, which probably you know, which you, you cannot drive your car for one day of the week. Uh, so uh, you, depending on the number of your plate, you know, you said Tuesdays, you know, you need to leave your car home. You know, that's it. So, um, and, they, and they, they were successful in Mexico City. Uh, however, in some other areas of Mexico, especially in the northern uh, areas of Mexico, where there's a lot of manufacturing, um, there's a lot of problems right now. If you go to the city, they do go to some of those cities, they still have not figured out how to uh, tackle, for example, a simple thing like, like water pollution. But, but it depends on the area and the region of Mexico. Many years ago, when I was a heck of a lot younger, I used to do business in various parts of the world. And I noticed when we did business in Mexico or Brazil or Argentina, all the people we dealt with uh, were immigrants from Germany, from Italy, from Spain, and so on. Is that still the case in Mexico? And B, is there still a lot of immigration from these European countries, or is that dried up? There's, there's not that much immigration into Mexico. Uh, nowadays from, from Europe. There's a lot of immigration from Latin America. So you, you see a lot of Argentinians, for example, Venezuelans, Colombians, uh, Guatemalans, uh, Costa Ricans in Mexico, that move to Mexico, but, but not European immigration. Uh, a lot of places in Mexico, especially northern Mexico where I'm from, there still was a lot of uh, European uh, European groups that move and they're going, like you said, a lot of people from Germany, from Poland as well. Uh, and a lot of them But no, the immigration right now is from Latin America. Yeah, and Mexico even had immigration from, from Asia, from, uh, from Japan and China. Uh, in the Pacific, in Baja, in Sonora, in Sinaloa, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, people from China came to the United States. Some of them decided to go to Mexico and New York there. And there's, strong, there's a strong Asian community as well that eventually mixed with the Asian population. Are the problems you describe the same for all parts of the country, or are there regional issues? Oh, there's, there's, there's tons of regional issues. It's, there's completely different um, what's going on. In, uh, for example, in some areas that are critical <coughs> logistical paths for drugs, so the problems there are completely different from, uh, from example, for example, Yucatan, which is completely separate from that. Uh, so the security problems there, they're, they're, they're almost you nil know, compared to those, those areas. Also, uh, the level of education in some states is way, way higher, uh, uh, for example, in Nuevo Young, than in places such as uh, Chiapas in Mexico. So there's, 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 there's definitely regional issues for a lot of people. Yes. Uh,
Uh, yes. A lot of manufacturing. What is the Mexican response to this many hundred mile wall that's been built in the United States? Well, today. They hate it. They hate it. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's really. Um, if, if, if you look at, at the. Uh, have, have you ever been to the. To the have you ever been to the U.S. Uh, Mexico border? Any of you? Yeah. Uh, um, if, if, if you? If you walk through the border, you go around the border, you, you just like do a flyover, uh, and you, you'll find areas which is really basically impossible to get the wall. Um, um, and, and, you, and let's suppose that you can build the wall around the border. The, the problem with building walls is you need to maintain the wall. You need to have the people to build the wall. So for example, there's some areas in Mexico that uh, you have a town of 10,000 people, and in the United States you have a town of 50 people. So, so it's, 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 it's going to be very, very difficult to, to stop 10,000 people to figure out a way to be 50 people that are living in the United States. <laughs> so, uh, so Napolitano, you, you, uh, when I used to, uh, to, to work with her in Arizona, she used to say, you know, if, if you build, you know, a hundred uh, tall wall, you know, people are going to figure out a way of uh, how, how to build a hundred foot long ladder. <laughs> and, and, and what's going on is that the wall is just one issue, but, but, but what's happening is a lot of these crime syndicates are actually doing tunnels. Kind of, so that's a way to get it. It's very easy. It's yeah. almost impossible to do that. And there's tons of them. People don't even know what's going on. <laughs> yes. Two questions, actually. Um, the, in relation to the religion question, the old quotation for Mexico, so close to the United States, so far from God. You've heard that one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but my question principally has to do with the Cabildo and its place in modern Mexican society or modern Latin American society. Now, is he still as powerful as deferred to? Uh, we have we have the example of Venezuela, but what about Mexico and the rest of the uh, Latin American countries? So, so Mexico, uh, with the Aztecs, he had a, a view called the Latin one, uh, which it was the, the almighty uh, god. He was a god person, um, and he ruled over all the, the the Aztec Empire. And then and then the, when the Spaniards came, they brought their own black like, figure, which is called the, the caudillo. You know, I mean, the caudillo was also all this. Almighty person, you know, that had all the power and control. So, so Mexico has the Spanish culture and the, the Aztec culture, and they mix them together, so they created this superpower, superpower God, you know, that had control over everything. And that's what happened pretty much for the, in the last, you know, the 90 years in Mexico. You had this image of the president being almost like a God. You know, whatever he wanted to do, um, he got done. Um, however, after 2000, uh, the power of the press has been uh, greatly diminished, and, and people they, they, they do not think of the of the press as this almighty power, and and um, and it's thanks to that now you have this dispersion of power. You have a lot of different groups that have enough power to stop um, the press from doing something. I, I remember a quote from uh, from one of my uh, uh, colleagues uh, in, in Mexico. He was a meeting. He was in a meeting with Calderon, with the president, and with Francis Lim as well, uh, the owner of Telmex, the largest communications company. So, so, uh, so they they went to a presentation, and the presentation they, they showed how what was the benefit of promoting competition in the telecommunications field. And, and Calderon says, you see, that's why it's important that you let other people compete against you. It's good for Mexico. It's good for lower prices and everything. And then Francis Lim. Before, that would have never happened in Mexico. But now, uh, a businessman can say, forget it, I'm not going to do that. And then they just can just, just go into the legal process and, and, and try to, you know, um, to do something about it. And, and, and what's going on in Mexico, people are, are becoming more affiliated with different parties instead of with the current policy. So, uh, and different powers have different, uh, different political parties have different powers. For example, if you want to do something in Mexico City, you need to align with the left leaning part. If you want to do something in some cities, some states in Mexico, you need to go with the right leaning part. 
and, and that's what's going on. But, but, but the, the, this, this, this image of the old Michael Dillo and Flaquani in Mexico is being very distinguished. Historically, it was important. Now, it's a little bit. When I lived in Mexico, one of the big differences was the Napoleonic Code, uh, guilty until proven innocent. Yes. Um, is that still in, how does that work now? Yes, it is still on, but Mexico is actually undergoing a reform to come up with oral uh, uh, proceedings, just like in the United States. So uh, you'll see more of that in the next few years. So yes, Mexico is based not in the code, but, but, uh, but hopefully uh, it'll change. You know, it's changing right now. Some states and some cities actually have oral mm -hmm. proceedings, and, 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 and the federal government is considering to do it at the federal level. So that, that, that's going to lower the prices a lot of any well, that, 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 for some, 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 some of you that may not know the system in Mexico is a, a, a judge decides everything. So and, and you cannot talk to the judge. So you need to write everything up. So you need to have a lawyer to write everything up. You know, uh, if you're guilty of a crime or not, or defend, whichever whatever it is, you need to put a legal brief together and you can give it to a judge which you never see and you never talk to. You know? And then they read it, they get the document, they review it, and then they decide by what you wrote, you know, if you're guilty or not. So, uh, so that is very, very difficult. Uh, uh, it's, first, you need to be very good at writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to really know the, le the legal system, you know, and, 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 and third, you really need to have a deep understanding of, 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 the, of, the, of the intricacies of, 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 of the Mexican legal code. And, um, and, and, for, and, and for most of the people in Mexico, that was impossible. It was, it was very difficult. Uh, it wasn't affordable. So uh, that's, why, that's why Mexico is moving to these oral arguments right now. And hopefully that they'll change the judicial uh, system. Yes? What motivated you to come to the United States? Grad school. <laughs> Columbia University. Public, uh, I wanted to study public policy. Uh, I applied to about three different places in the States, including Bristol University, and, uh, and then three in the UK. So, um, and then I got accepted in several of them, including Bristol, but then I decided to go to New York City. Um, but, and, but, but my thinking is, was I was in Mexico working in the government, but then I thought that I just could not go any further if I stayed there. So I said, like, well, I need to get better skills. I need to really understand how, how government works. So that's why I say, well, I need to learn more. So that's why I applied to grad school. The federal election in, uh, what was covered in the media here you know, focused so much on the disputed vote, and it seemed like there were the parties were at loggerheads. And what what caused what how did that uh, amazing uh, cooperation that you spoke of evolve after what sounded to, to me, at least to the media, like a, a really volatile political situation? So, so that's recent. Uh, that's very recent. This is the last few months. Uh, the last elections in Mexico, they're all being disputed. Um, but, but it is becoming more difficult to dispute the elections because you're winning some and losing some. So it's not like you're losing all the time. So that was easier for, for a party to say, well, you know what, the system is rigged because you always lost everything. But now you're winning a governorship, you're winning a you know, city, uh, but you're not winning the presidency. So that's what's, that, what's going on. And, and for Mexicans, it's very easy to argue there was fraud because people you know, were used for 70 years to say there was fraud. You know, so that's why that was just a very political argument to say, you know what, the system is rigged. You know, that's why I didn't so um, that was just the natural uh, 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 political response. It's actually <coughs> Mexico, you, you, when you lose elections, you don't pick up the phone that, uh, that evening, you know, and call the other one to, to say, you know what, congrats, you know, I lost. <laughs> People in Mexico don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so it, it just, it just that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different system. People just say, okay, I lost, you know, I, I'm not going to congratulate you, I'm just going to wait and see what, what happens. Uh, and, and, and that's what's going on right now. 
uh, and but, but, but the, the, the Mexican politicians are learning, and, and some of them, you know, say they said, well, I, I want to get something really done. I need to work with my other colleagues. And before, everybody had their own ideas, but now they're working. It's difficult. Uh, it's been taking about since 2000, so it's about 12, 13 years right now for, for Mexican politicians to learn to work together, and they, they're finally doing it. It's not easy, and sometimes they're going to have a lot of issues, but right now, it's successful in, in some area, not all. Of In, in Mexico, you do not elect judges or, uh, or sheriffs or attor attorney generals. How much of an impact are things like the internet and Facebook and having on the way Mexicans view the world and the way they view the government? So um, a few weeks ago, uh, Friedman had a call in the New York Times in which he talked about this. And there's a lot of companies, a lot of entrepreneurs in Mexico are building these applications to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to respond to any government policies or to, uh, to, to make the government aware of any potential issues or things that need to be fixed. So a lot of, a lot of young Mexicans are using the internet to, uh, to and they're using it as a, as a dialogue mechanism for the government to respond to their needs. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been successful so far. Until today, they launched an application for, for people in Mexico City to, with, their, with their mobile phone to, to call their, their closest, uh, the, 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 the policeman that is closest to themselves and the one that is, in, is, is, is actually living around his neighborhood. So they can talk to him, get to know him, you know, figure out how they can solve the crime in the area. So those, the, that, those applications and, and, and internet are, are really helping strengthen that battle between you know, the citizens and the government. But they're, they're, they're very successful. What's being done at the federal level to stop the flow of drugs from Central and South America into Mexico? Well, um, the federal government had, they, they brought down the, the military to the southern border and they tried to come up with a whole uh, perimeter around the border to protect Protected. However, the, the price of bringing drugs into Mexico is very cheap. Uh, I mean, if you want to get a pound of marijuana into the United States, it's about hundred dollars. But if you want to do it from, from Guatemala to Mexico, it's about ten cents. So, so it's very easy. Uh, there's a lot of economic incentives, you know, there to uh, to protect that. And um, one of the other problems in Mexico is just like in the United States. I mean, the, the border with Guatemala is a jungle, so it's almost impossible to protect. So if, if, if there is a demand, there's a continuous demand for drugs, there is going to be, uh, there's always going to be a, a way to get it into Mexico. And one, one of the new things that is going on in Mexico right now is that Mexico now, because it's richer and getting more money, uh, they're actually becoming a, a drug consumption country. So they're consuming a lot of these drugs. Like cocaine, marijuana, they're, they're using it. Right? And that's becoming a big, big problem. Could you describe the healthcare system in Mexico? Is there equivalent to our social security system? There is. There, uh, Mexico system is, is very similar to the Canadian system. Uh, so anybody can go to, to, to the hospital. Uh, but also there's a social security system as well. Uh, so health is free uh, for everybody. And, 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 uh, and the level of, of, of um, the service that you get varies greatly. Large urban area, you know, you, you may have access to a very good hospital, but if you are in a very rural area in Mexico, it's going to be very difficult for you to get to But uh, it's very similar. Are those systems under financial strain as Arizona? Actually, no. Um, one of the things that Mexico does is that they, they produce a lot of, a lot of drugs uh, and a lot of vaccines are produced within the country. Uh, and, and a lot of generic drugs are produced uh, by, by Mexican companies. They, they sold those drugs cheaply to the government. And that's where you see a lot of people <coughs> buying those generic drugs from Mexico here in the United States because they're significantly cheaper. Mm -hmm. And also the cost of maintaining a dentist is about, about 20,000, 20 times more. It's cheaper to get your, 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 your teeth treated in Mexico than in the United States. 
It's just the labor cost. So, so it's really it's about a, there. Mexico has about 170 million people, and and, 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 the, and the health system is not in good shape, but is not is not struggling as much as the United States uh, because the cost of food is more, and the cost of producing uh, a lot of the medicines are more. Is the role of women in the health Mexican society evolving? Actually, yesterday I had a conversation with, with, a, with a former uh, politician in Mexico that was telling me that Mexico is changing too fast in, in regards to the role of women. For example, <laughs> right now in Mexico, it's by law, okay, you, you, you need to have an equal number of candidates, women as men. So, uh, so all parties need to do that. You do not comply, I mean, they take your, uh, to re to you to register. So a lot of a lot of these politicians are trying to figure out, you know, how to get women engaged. A lot of them. So if you go to and and, and some of them are being very successful at and, 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 and it's changing really the role of women in Mexico very, very fast. So uh, you'll see a lot of women mayors, a lot of uh, uh, the, the former attorney general of Mexico was a woman as well. Uh, a lot of a lot of high level senators and congresswomen uh, in the United States. They're, they're becoming very powerful as well, but the role of women is, is, is rapidly changing. And it's, and it's thanks to that, that change in 2000 that says, well, now everybody needs to have a voice. Let's figure out a way to make, to make uh, an equal play field to everybody. So woman was a very important part of it. But do you think it's changing in oh. society? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can see it at the political level and mandated change, but is it changing at the, at the let's say, the grassroots level? But at the grassroots levels is changing, and Mexican, I mean, depends on depends on when where you see it. Political level is changing. If you look at the business world, it's also changing as well. For example, the most successful software entrepreneur in Mexico is a woman. Her name is Blanca Trevino, and she has a, a very large uh, IT company that has operations in China. Um, but if if you if you, so that's politicians, that uh, business woman as well. Um, but if you go to to to, uh, to middle uh, income, you know lower income uh, <coughs> Mexicans, you know, of course the, the change is, is more difficult to get there. But but a lot of the a lot of the uh, welfare programs in Mexico are set up in a way in which any support welfare support for, for any families is actually given to the woman, not to the to the, to the, to the not to the to the, to the man. So, so, so that is empowering a lot of women because they get the welfare, they have control, they get the money, so they, they get to decide what to do. So um, that is changing, um, not as fast as, as in the other areas, but it's, it's changing. What about equal payment? Equal payment? Uh, not yet. Equal payment in Mexico is not yet. Uh, you were just talking about briefly about you know, the education system and how it's suffering just the same as us is K through 12. Correct. Uh, my question is like, since it is struggling, uh, our, our government, federal and state, have been helping us through education students like myself who receive funding from the government. Uh, we're just, I'm just curious because you said 50% of the population is under 29. Right. Is the government doing anything about, like, are they, are they also doing like education bills? Are they, you know, funding? Uh, you know, individual students who cannot afford the education? Or is it just going to those uh, prosperous elites, just as the monopolies who are able to get the education? Correct. Yeah, so, so in, in Mexico, um, education is free. Uh, it's mandatory until, until junior high. And, and you, can get in, you can get in, you can, you can actually get free high school as well. And the majority of, of, of the schools in Mexico, the universities are free of charge. Like the United States, you know, look at Arizona State, for example, is ten thousand uh, dollars. Uh, that's a state university here. Uh, it's one of the cheapest ones. But in Mexico, for example, NAM is about one dollar per semester, so it's very, very cheap. However, uh, the problem is that there is not that many. So there's a lot of a lot of Mexicans that cannot get in, into those universities. So what's happening is whoever cannot get into those universities, they either need to go to the private ones and try to pay a lot more to do it. So um, 
And Mexico has yet to develop a lot of, of safety nets that the United States the United States has in terms of helping students. For example, in Mexico there's not student loans. Uh, so if you don't have the money, you cannot go to school, uh, to a private school. But you can go to a public one if you can get in. So the problem with Mexico is there's there's a there's a pipeline problem. There's a lot of there's 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 a lot of good places, but there's not enough for them. And and the places that are available, there there, there are there are three 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 uh, four of them. But but there's not that many. And a lot of them end up filling the ranks of you know of you know technical schools or they just leave and then they start working. Sorry, just follow-up question. Sure. So how hard is it to get into schools? I know in like governments like China, you know, uh, they actually do have like a, a, a standards <coughs> testing. We have like our SATs in the US, but I'm just curious if there's like any follow-up testing that you need to apply in order to get into those schools. Yes, there's a there's a federal testing system uh, implemented in which everybody just applies if they have the same test. And depending on your scores, you be able to get into different schools. Uh, but yes. If uh, you were asked by the United States Congress to come and testify about the immigration bill that Jim shall be approaching, what would you tell the U.S. Congress to do? <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I, would, I would say that, that it's actually benefitable for the economy of the United States uh, to promote immigration. Historically, the United States has had immigration from a lot of different places, and it always has benefited from the United States. Uh, a lot of, uh, as the United States needs to constantly have a, work, a, a workforce that will take care of people that are only. Otherwise, it will eventually reach a plateau and there will not be <coughs> so, so the United States needs to figure out a way to create, to create the system in which it will allow sensible immigration into the country. And a, a, lot of, a lot of these different immigrants, they need to have different skills depending on the different industries. So for example, some of them need to be very skilled in engineering, you know, uh, or math, for example, for the, uh, for the companies in the Silicon Valley, but a lot of them are going to be very simple and they don't have to manage others in Arizona because there's not that many people that know how to do it and they need the workers to do that as well. So, so, so it needs different immigrants for different levels. So I think it's for the own benefit. 